How is everybody? You stay dry? All right. Sorry, I'm just getting a little set up here, if that's all right. I am grateful for our worship team. Anybody grateful for that team of volunteers? And I know that's just part of them. We have a rotating team throughout the months, but uh, man, they're, they just love how they bring us into the presence of the Lord and seek God as we go together. All right. <clears throat> Whew. This morning, uh, this morning I want to talk about a, a topic. Um, well, let's go back. A couple months ago, a couple months ago, I had this little epiphany over my own life, like a light bulb moment. And it was this moment that I was not walking in truth that I should be walking in. Does that make sense? And this was the truth. You see, in John chapter 19, verse 30, uh, if you read through that part of the gospel, that is um, the crucifixion of Christ, actually, in the gospel of John. And um, verse 30 is where they actually take some... I think they said sour vinegar or something, which I always thought was weird because isn't all vinegar always sour? It sounds gross. But anyhow, and they gave it to Jesus to drink, and he refuses it, and he dies in that moment, and he says, it is finished, and he gives up the ghost. And the truth that I feel like the Lord reminded me I wasn't walking in was the reality that as Christians, so much was purchased for us on the cross, so much was accomplished at Calvary. So much um, was brought to us because of the uh, crucifixion of our Lord that we are actually meant to walk in. It's meant to affect our life. More than simply saying, uh, okay, you, you know, Lord, forgive me of our sin and coming into the kingdom. If that was the only thing that happened, it would be awesome and perfect. But there's so much that Christ did at Calvary that goes beyond that, that, that takes us into the purposes and plans of God for our own life and if we aren't careful, we forget that. And if we aren't careful, we begin to think of God as over there or over here instead of right with me. So this morning, I want to go through a few scriptures in the book of Colossians. And my intent is this, that if you are like me, and maybe just there's one or two of you that are putting Jesus over here and not realizing the truth of, of the reality of what it means that Jesus said it is finished on the cross, that maybe we'll walk out of here a little encouraged today. Fair warning, I get a little intense. My intensity is not marked at you. My intensity is marked at the fact that we have an accuser of the brethren that loves to tell us we're not good enough, and it frustrates me. All right? All right, so let's, let's, set, the, let's set the stage. Um, when Jesus said, it is finished, uh, what, was he, what was he communicating? Um, I think it's two things. I think, first and foremost, he's saying, I accomplished that which the Father sent me to accomplish. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I think you can find that in the Gospels. And, and the second part, which is just as important, I think, is not only did I accomplish that for which I was sent to do, but when he said, it is finished, I think he was saying, and I have triumphed. Everything's going to be different from this moment forward for all of eternity. That's the big one. Both of them together, right? So in my little study Bible, I want to read this because I thought it was helpful. The words that we translate in our Bible as it is finished is one Greek word. I'm not going to share it because I don't speak Greek. It's long and complicated. But it is finished is one word in the Greek, and it declares that the work was done and the results continue. Isn't that interesting? The results. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago, the results of that continue in your life and mine. And that's the real question. When we talk about the finished work of, the, of Calvary, the finished work of what Jesus did, am I living in the reality of the results that continue in my life? That's a big question. In other words, do I read Scripture? When I, when I pull open my Bible, do I read Scripture in light of the fact that those results, what Jesus did on Calvary, affect me today? I, I live from that place, not looking to get to that place, but as a believer, I live from that place. When I pray for somebody, do I beg God or do I recognize, no, no, he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. He's with me. I'm, I'm not a God beggar. I'm a God believer. The Bible says that faith is our victory, that we take hold of what the scripture says and we grab hold of it and we run with it. Amen? So that's what we're talking about today. Now, the other... Um, 
a few more things I think will be helpful to us um, is talking about what was the assignment that Jesus said it is finished over. And there's a bunch of that. I mean, you could go into um, uh, uh, Old Testament prophecy. He fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies, and that was part of why he came was to prove the word of the Lord was actually true. God said this is what's going to happen, and it was fulfilled in the life of Christ. And there's a whole bunch of things that the Lord um, accomplished at Calvary and through his life, death and resurrection. Um, but I want to focus on three because I think they'll be helpful. The first one is in Luke chapter 4. They are trying to get Jesus to go somewhere and do something. I forget what it was, but he says, no, I have to go preach to this town over here, for that was why I was sent, to preach the good news. So part of what Jesus was sent to do was to preach the gospel, preach the good news. He, he came with a message. Secondly, in that same chapter, it actually says um, that he came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't just have a message, he had a mandate or a mission. And he was going after something. He was going after a, a reality where salvation would now be open to everybody. Right? It's not universalism in that everybody is saved, but it is open to everybody. Right? He made a way where you and I can come, repent, and call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And that's what happens. That's a, the, 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 the offer is universal, um, but not the effect of it, because we have a part to play. And the third thing is this, in 1 John 3, 8, it says, For the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. I want to propose to you today, when he said it is finished, all three of those were finished. He preached what he was supposed to preach. He made a way for people to be saved, and he destroyed, past tense, the works of the devil. And today, as we get into Scripture, my heart and my prayer is that, that the truth will come alive in us in such a way, and even me, as I preach it, I pray that God would just open up my eyes as another layer, another reality of what Christ did on the cross. And this is the reason, is because um, I, you don't necessarily, I don't think, need to read the Bible to know that in the end times, the, the, there's, there's going to be a, a, a big dichotomy between light and darkness. And honestly, if you look at our culture around us, we don't live in a very light-filled culture. Amen? Anybody else feel the pressure? There's just a lot of, there's a lot of things that I believe grieve the heart of God. And this, and this, this is a little different, but I want to share it with you. In Isaiah chapter 60, um, there's actually a call to us that is so relevant to us as Christians in our day. <clears throat> And it says this, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. So many people want to take the scripture and say, oh, that means, the Old Testament prophecy means that's, that's Jesus. No, no, Jesus didn't need a light to come. He was the light. That's to us. He says, Arise, shine, the prophet says, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. See darkness, it covers the whole earth. Thick darkness, the peoples. But the Lord rises on you and his glory appears over you. The nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. There's a promise that as, as the darkness gets greater, as the darkness may, might feel overwhelming, as we might get discouraged with some stuff, that we are called to live as people of the light. We're not called to fight the darkness. We're just simply called to live in the light. You know, I wrote down, um, I thought for me it was really interesting. I thought that there's a, uh, what did I say here? As I'm putting this together, I, got, I, I just, this, the wording of this was helpful to me. Do you know that light is always noticed in the darkness? Light is always noticed in the darkness. As a believer in Jesus, if you think that our job is to kind of hide in Jehovah sneaky through some stuff, that's not exactly the idea. The idea is that we're to be a light everywhere we go. We're to be a light that shines. In fact, he says, don't, don't cover it. Don't cover your, your bushel back, basket because you have a light. And... and um, and this morning, I pray that what we talk about encourages us just to shine bright. Because what we have, whether they know it or not, the world needs. Amen? All right. All right. And then the second piece I want to talk about that becomes the backdrop for this is in the second verse. So it's Colossians 1-2. Sorry, I don't have um, the scriptures on the screen. I'm kind of just um, flowing through some stuff, so I wasn't prepared for them. Uh, but Colossians, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to spend a lot of time there. One and two. And the second verse says this. It says, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. And that term, holy and faithful, is another Greek word that I can't say. Um, but it's translated elsewhere, and we'll see it a little bit later, as this word. And it's the word saints. 
Before we get into understanding what Christ purchased for us at the cross, we have to change our thinking, some of us, in one area. Um, and it's this. It's who are the saints of God? We read it in the scripture and we see Paul's letter saying to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints at Colossae, to the saints in, Cor in Corinth. And we understand, who's he talking to? The believers, the church, the people who lived in those locations at that time. The ones who have called on the name of the Lord. The ones who have put their faith in Christ. And we get that. Fast forward 2,000 years. Um, there's been a lot in our culture that would say saints are specific people that have died 2,000 years ago that somebody deemed to be a saint because of some funky thing they did. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in a culture that believed that. And, I, and I'm not sitting here to try to pick on anybody. I'm simply saying if that's what I believe, then it removes the truth of this scripture from me because this book was written to saints. And if that's not you, then this book isn't for you. But I want to say today, if you've called on the name of the Lord, then Paul calls you a saint, right? If you're one who serves the Lord Jesus, then this book is for you and the truth in it is for your life. And it's really important that we, we understand. You know, Jesus' message was very simple. It was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And sometimes as believers, it's a little challenging because the kingdom of heaven is right here and we see it. We see sometimes the effect of it as people get touched by God or there's prophetic words or people get healed or whatever it is. Things happen because the kingdom is right here. And yet, it's not fully realized, right? Because in the kingdom of heaven, when it's fully manifest and we're with the Lord, there will be no sighing, crying, or dying. There'll be no effect of sin, we live in the kingdom. We live affected by the kingdom. It's right here at hand, but we still see the effects of sin and hurt and pain. One day that won't be the case. And so sometimes just balancing these thoughts can be challenging for us because we're like, wait a minute, I thought saints were just up in heaven. No, saints are in Biddeford, Maine. Saints live in Arundel. Saints live over in Lyman. And Paul would write a letter to us this day and he'd say, hey, the saints that go to New Life Church because there's other saints that go to other churches, but the saints that go to this church, I have some words for you this morning. So let's get that in mind, that no matter, it's, we're, we're called saints because of what Jesus did, not because of how good we are, amen? How many made it in on their own? How many made it in because of Jesus? That's it, so that, now we're all on the same page. Sorry if I beat the dead horse, we'll go back to it later. All right, so um, just a few things that I want to actually talk about. What are some truths that will help us as we engage with God, as we read the word, as we pray, and as we minister. How many know that um, there's more than one minister here today? It's not just the guy on the stage. But if, you're, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you're a minister of the gospel. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. yeah. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage your ministry. I want to encourage you. So here it is. The first, the first, um, first one is uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. And it says this, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you, which is interesting, pay attention, it's past tense, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Oh, it's really important. It's really important that we recognize we've been qualified right? Somebody's, somebody's made a way for us. When you're an Olympian, you have to qualify to get into the Olympics, and that's all on your own merit, your own skill, right? Your own working hard. Well, that's not the case in the kingdom of God. We've been qualified by somebody else. We've been qualified by Christ. And why is that important? Because I don't know about your life, but in my life, I've had um, the effects of what I like to call a spirit of religion, you know what the spirit of religion is? Jesus is walking along Nazareth, and the Pharisees are kind of giving him a hard time. The Sadducees, um, you know, they, they're looking for Jesus, can never find him. So they're sad, you see, all the time. It's a dad joke. But he actually says this. He says, you search the scriptures to find me, and yet I'm standing right in front of you, and you don't see me. The religious take the word of God and use it to divide people from the Father. And they say, the religious spirit will say, you're not good enough. You can't make a way. You can't, you, there's nothing you can do. You're, God's not on your side. You've screwed up too far. The religious spirit says, spirit says, you haven't checked all the right boxes. But the gospel says, you know what? The gospel actually agrees with that and says, that's right. I haven't checked all the right boxes. I'm not good enough. 
but Jesus qualified me. But Jesus made a way. And this scripture in Colossians reminds us that as we engage with the word of God, we need to engage with it as a people who have been qualified. That Jesus made a way. And I'm not reading scripture simply to learn about the travels of Paul or to get better at my job, although all those things can actually be true. I'm reading scripture because Jesus is the pearl of great prize. And in it, I want to find a deeper revelation of my king. I'm reading scripture because I carry the one who it speaks about. And I need to learn and, and I, want to, I want to hear his voice and walk with him in the reality of that. Do you know the scripture actually says, it says that, that if we renew our mind according to the word of God, that we actually begin to prove his will. How many would like to prove the will of the Lord? I'd like to prove the will of the Lord. It says, you want to prove the will of the Lord, renew your mind according to the scripture, according to the word of God. Begin to think like he thinks. And one of the first things that the enemy wants us to do is disqualify us. And this scripture says, nope, you are qualified to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints. It's super easy for us to see somebody else as a saint. Sometimes it's difficult for us to realize Jesus calls you a saint. Isn't that true? Like, um, how do I say this? Like, when you are ministering with somebody, how many know if you love someone that's hurting, you pray for them, you bring the, the hope of Christ to them, you give them a hug in Christ, that's ministry. Jesus says you give a cup of cold water to somebody in need, in my name, that's ministry. The, the bar for ministry is low because he's inside of us, so whatever we do, if we do it with him, that's ministry. Amen? Amen. Up and down for yes, side to side for no. It's good all on the same page. So you go to somebody and you begin to minister them in the love of Jesus. The enemy, I want to encourage you, the enemy is going to tell them no matter what you do, you, you come to them with the word of God, you come to them loving them, you come to them any way you can. The enemy in the back is, is going to always be telling them they're not good enough, they can't measure up, they can't do it. And sometimes the best thing we can do is tell someone, no, agree with that, it's okay. He may be a liar, but in this case, he's right, we can't measure up. So just accept the free gift of Jesus Christ. Just accept that he's qualified us today. And I think that just pushes that lie right out of that, gets rid of all that religious mumbo jumbo. Anyways, second one, uh, Colossians chapter one, verse 20. The first one is the idea that on, because of the cross, you've, you've been qualified. He's forgiven your sin. He's made a way for you. And the second one is this, verse 20 says, and through him, talking about Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on, in earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Anybody um, in your travels run across somebody that lacks peace? Yes, it's everywhere. We live in a society that doesn't know peace. And worse yet, many of us in the church don't actually know peace. I want to encourage us today that the scripture says peace is not something you need to attain Peace was purchased for you, the scripture says, by the shed blood of Jesus. So how do, we, how do we access that which God has purchased for us? It's by faith. It sounds silly, but it's simply by believing it. Do you know the scripture says that he wants to give us a peace that surpasses all understanding? So what does that mean? It means sometimes we have to be okay not understanding to receive his peace. The flip side is true. If I require that I require of God that I understand everything, many times I'll find myself without peace. Not all the time, but I want to propose to you, there's times in your life where you can't have both. You can choose peace or you can choose understanding. And our great privilege as a believer is we trust when we don't understand. Amen? There are times in our life where things happen and God calls us to peace. He said, Tom, peace is available. But, but Jesus... I don't understand why X, Y, Z happened. And his response, half the time, I don't know if you're like me, he doesn't answer my question. He just says, peace is available. Yes, Jesus, I understand peace is available, but would you please tell me what's going on here? And he doesn't. He just says, peace is available. And I want to encourage us that that is purchased for us, it says in this scripture, by through his blood shed on the cross, Jesus was making peace. The scripture goes on to say, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your own minds because of evil behavior, but now he's reconciled you through Christ. 
through Christ's physical body, through death, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now this part has a balancing section to it. Some promises are unilateral, where God comes and he's like, boom, this is a promise. Jesus is coming back. That's a promise. No matter what you do, he's still coming back. This one, you have a part to play. And it says that the next verse says, well, let me read it again. It says, um, you've been reconciled through Christ's physical body to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And then it says, if, everyone say if. If means I have a part to play. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. The scripture tells us faith is our victory. If I'll just take hold of the word of God, make it my own, grab hold of it and not let go. Faith is my victory. And the scripture tells me that if I don't let go of that faith that's in my heart, that he will one day present me holy in his sight. How many want that? Yeah, that's a good news. All right, trick question. I'm just going to throw it. It's a trick question, so take the pressure off. How many righteous people do we have here today? I'm not going to share with you, but there's a couple hands up, and the rest of us are like, I don't know. I, I think he's tricking me, but I'm not sure. There's a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that's going to explain to you something that is part of what Jesus did on the cross. Honestly, this scripture has the power to shift how we walk out the rest of our days if we grab hold of it in such a, it's so good. Uh, hold on. You're probably there before me. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 something, 21. It says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him, in Christ, we might become the very righteousness of God in Christ. He takes on our sin so that we can take on his righteousness. How many righteous people do we have here today? Amen. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, if you've, if you've poured your heart, if you've, if you've chosen to put your faith into Christ, if you've been forgiven of your sin, if you're in the saints, which we just talked about, then the Lord looks at you as righteous, right standing with God. And you say, yeah, but Pastor Tom, all he needs to do is look at yesterday, and he knows that's not true. The reality is that we come to God qualified not on our own good works, but on his, not on our own stuff. It doesn't mean we don't have things we need to get right. It doesn't mean we don't have things we need to repent of. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to become people looking more like Jesus all the time. Do you know in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Anybody like to make bread? Anybody like to eat bread? Anybody not going to raise your hand no matter what I say? I like to do both. Um, but when you make bread, you put leaven in it, and what happens? You set it for a time, and all of a sudden that, that yeast goes through the whole loaf. And Jesus said, that's what the kingdom's like. And I can understand why, as, as, as maybe you were beginning our walk with God, there's a real great frustration because it seems like nothing but a, uh, I, I'm on a mountaintop with Jesus, and now I'm in a valley because my life stinks and I've disobeyed the Lord. But the idea is that as we walk more and more with the Lord, that leaven of the kingdom begins to walk, and we begin to walk out our righteousness, right? That things that used to drag us down, those sins that so easily beset us years ago, aren't the same things that, that are dragging us down today because we've got we get victory. We've learned to walk in faith. We've learned to grab hold of the word of God. We've learned who God says that we are because faith is our victory. So this scripture is just really amazing if you think about it that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you and for I so that we could become the very righteousness of Christ. That's powerful. How do we do that? It's through the cross. What happens if I don't, what happens, number one, if I live that way? Let's go backwards. What happens if I don't live that way? If I don't live that way, I open my Bible every day and I'm looking for ways to beat myself up. Honestly, I, I know from talking to enough people that that's some people's reaction. And there's no condemnation. I'm not here to beat you up more. I'm just saying that the Lord didn't write his word so that you could get up at five in the morning, open it, and learn how terrible of a person you are. <laughs> he wrote his word so that we could learn how wonderful of a person he is. 
And all of a sudden, all of our failings, all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of our weakness somehow fades away as we begin to see the one for whom all, all this is for, right? And all of a sudden we go from, you know, oh, I, I, I sinned. I don't like to say screwed up because it sounds like it's no big deal. No, sin is sin, and I think we, we got to be willing to call it for what it is, all right? Um, and if that sin drives me to run and hide from God, we haven't quite got it. There's a, a wonderful story of David I love. I love to, he taught me so much in some of what he did. And I don't know this for sure, but it appears to me that at times when David screwed up, he didn't run from God, he actually ran to him. Almost like, God, I screwed up. You know, Moses, I'm totally getting off the sidetrack, but this just is my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. So I'm just gonna share it. Moses, um, when the, the um, whoever they are, the Israelites, we came out of Egypt. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, the Israelites came out of Egypt. It says that they encamped in the wilderness, and he actually went and he took a tent, and he went outside the camp, and he set up the cam- uh, a tent. And it says that Moses just set up a tent, and he said, that's the tent of meeting. I, I don't know. Maybe you know the answer to this. I, did, I didn't find anywhere in Scripture where God told Moses to do that. It might be there. I'm not saying it's not. I never found it. But Moses goes, throws up a tent and he says, this is where I'm going to meet with God. Like he just said, that's what's going to happen there. And Moses would walk outside the camp and everyone honored Moses. They just saw God work on his behalf. And it says the whole, the whole company of people, which some estimate three to five million people, would stand at the doors of their tents and watch their leader walk out to the tent of meeting. He walks out. And it says that when Moses got there, the Lord appeared and would meet to him, meet with him face to face like a man meets with his friend. Okay, is that powerful? Is that cool? Okay, is anybody else like wowed by that? Like to me, that's like something inside of me says, I want that God, okay? Fast forward to the book of Hebrews and it says, hey, Tom, you live under a better covenant than Moses ever did. How is that possible? How is it possible that Moses could meet face to face with God like a man meets with his friends? They visibly saw the glory of the Lord come down and he would have an encounter with God. It's possible because of Colossians chapter 1, verses 25. It says, I have become a servant by the commission of God gave me. I'm going to skip ahead. 26. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. We heard that word in verse 2, right? Same word, the saints, the holy people of God. This mystery that Paul's about to talk about was hidden for generations and ages, and he's about to make it known in this letter to the Colossians. And he says this, verse 27, to them, God, who's them? It's to the people of God. It's to the the Gentiles, the saints of God, the people of God. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the Messiah, in you, the hope of glory. And I think, in my, I can't speak for you, but I think in my own life, I haven't grasped the reality of the fact that 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 promise of Jesus living inside of me is a better covenant promise than when Moses met with God in the tent. The book of Hebrews tells us so, that this is a better covenant we live under, better promises, it says, than, than what the old covenant was. And all that tells me, something inside of my heart, it's not self-condemning, it's not where I go back and I, I beat myself up, it just says, Tom, something is available in God that you haven't tapped into yet. You carry the king with you into every circumstance. And unfortunately, sometimes, how many people have ever felt the presence of the Lord? Anybody in here say, I felt God's presence, one way or another. We all define that different, differently. Now, of the people that have, put those hands up again. Who says, I felt the presence of, okay. You know, you define that how you mean, but we felt God. That is, a, that is a biblical experience of the presence of God becoming manifest in a group of people where you actually encounter God. Now, of those people that put their hands up, how many have ever had a time when they're like, I just couldn't feel the presence of God no matter what I did? All right, a lot of the hands, mine included, is still up. Did God move? No. He doesn't move. Because what did he say? He said, I never leave you nor forsake you. I'm never going to leave you nor turn my eyes away. So what happened? I just lost the awareness of his presence. He was still there the whole time. And his challenge to me is, Tom, will you believe my word over your feelings? 
You feel like you're alone. You feel unqualified. You feel unforgiven. You feel like you're not my child. You feel as though, and he's like, no, I want you to believe my word because faith is the victory. If we grab hold of the truth of the word of God and we take it to the grave and say, no way, this is true. If everybody in the world calls me a liar, I believe that Jesus Christ lives inside of me and he's the hope of glory. He's the hope for every person on this earth. When I walk in to Hannaford, to some degree, who walks in with me? Jesus. When you walk in to Market Basket, there's a light that walks into Market Basket that wasn't there five minutes ago. When you have in your job a very volatile situation with people that just are filled with vitriol, hate, and anger, and you walk in there, you walk in there as a carrier of peace because of what Jesus did on the cross. And you get the great privilege of saying, God, anything is possible. I feel like I'm about ready to get shot, but who knows? It's the truth. You ever seen God turn a situation? I did this week. I had the great privilege of seeing God turn a situation. It was so beautiful. The, 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 the anger in the room was palpable and loud. And some people from this church were praying for me, and I texted her. I said, keep praying. And within five minutes, the entire situation shifted, and the people that were at each other began to ask for each other's forgiveness and confess their love for one another. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of what the church is supposed to be like. It's a vision for, okay, I'm, I carry Christ. I owe the world an encounter with God because I had the privilege of having one myself. Amen? All right. Am I beating that dead horse too much? No. Okay, I appreciate it. You're my favorite person today. <laughs> I'm just going to preach to you, my friend. <laughs> The last one is this, it's Colossians chapter 2. Just some thoughts of, of what Jesus did at the cross that might help shape how we read the Bible, how we pray, how we minister, how we worship. We don't worship as people trying to beg God to help us. We worship as people who are called sons. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. We are, we are called by Scripture sons and daughters of the King. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Who are the brethren? That's you and me. One of my first trips to Africa, uh, to Ghana, uh, we were in, I remember praying with some local people and there was a gentleman who just blessed my socks off. He, he constantly called Jesus his elder brother. And I finally had to be like, what are you talking about? Like, I just, I didn't get his terminology. And he goes, oh no, my friend, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He's my older brother. And I thought, wow, if that doesn't shape how you think, come on, Jesus is your older brother. That's a good word. Okay, uh, last one. Well, maybe two. We'll skip it. Um, Colossians 2, verses 15. So remember, at the beginning, we talked about Jesus' commission was to preach the gospel. His commission was to seek and save the lost. In 1 John 3, 8, how, um, that he was supposed to destroy the works of the devil. This talks about that. Colossians 2, chapter 15. And it's talking about, remember, this is the context of what Jesus did on the cross, what he completed on the cross, the, that I get the availability to live in the light of that, that I never forget that. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I'm told, I'm not a historian, I'm told that back in the day when uh, warring tribes or factions or whatever would go to war, the victor many times would leave the chief of the other village alive and they would tie them up and they would parade them through their own city so that the the winning victorious chief could be like look who I got look who I won put them on display for all to see this guy is now my captor captive that's what the scripture is talking about at least that's what it looks like to me it says and having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. How many times in our Christian walk do we hear language of warfare that seems more focused on the devil than it is on Jesus? It's true. You know, um, I didn't, the, true story. When I was probably 16, our... Uh, uh, our church had this thing where we would, we had four parish, we had four, we had four parishes in, um, in our community and we would take a wooden cross on Holy Thursday and we walk all over town from church to church and pray in the churches. 
And, and uh, slightly before this time, uh, the Lord actually showed me the, the reality of this verse um, through a, an open vision that I had. And uh, once he showed me the reality that Jesus disarmed principalities, um, man, I was just ready to go. And uh, we were going to this one church. There was probably 50 people, you know, lugging this wooden cross, and we're in the middle of town at like 9 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, coming back in the, in the uh, line, somebody says, oh, oh there's, there's some Satanists that are coming to curse us. And everyone's freaking out. And my, myself and a friend were like, oh, oh, yeah? Where? Because we thought, well, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I have this thing called, this person called Jesus in me. I'm the real threat. Isn't that true? I'm the threat, not, not of violence. I'm the threat that the, the, the work of the enemy in your life is about to come to an end because greater is he that is in me than he that is in you. And so I remember running to the front of the line trying to find these people. They had long gone. But it was the beginning of looking to see things differently, right? You know you begin to think differently about spiritual warfare when you look for Jesus in every situation instead of a devil. And you realize that no matter what you're confronted with, you don't need to have an answer because you know the answer. And he's going to make a way where there is no way. And he's going to see you through it. And you may be walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but the Bible says he's going to have you walk through that thing. Enemies may, may be all around you, but the scripture actually says that he's going to prepare a table before you so they can watch while you enjoy a little feast with your king. In the, 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 the greatest thing we can do in spiritual warfare, warfare is to look for a fork. What do I mean by that? It's the psalm that says when you're in the midst of your enemies, he says he creates a table before you. So my, my focus is either going to be my enemies or it's going to be the feast the Lord puts before me. What do we feast on in spiritual warfare? We feast on the Lord's faithfulness. We remember. We, we begin to pull it up in our spirit. We remember the times he's delivered us. We remember the, 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 the relationships he's restored, the people he's healed. We remember the good things he's done. We remember that he's never let us down. We begin to feast on the faithfulness of the Lord. And let me tell you, the devil wants none of that. All of a sudden, these things that began to be so big you know, I remember an old-time preacher saying, don't, don't talk to God about how big your mountains are. Talk to your mountains about how big your God is. All of a sudden, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And so I want to, I want to encourage us today that these are just some areas that as we, in, as we walk this life out with God, that he's calling us to walk in light of the cross that is a finished work. Why don't you stand with me? I want to go back and talk about... One of my favorite ones of that is, which is, we talked about, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there's some language I learned at the beginning of the year that actually helped me process through that. If I'm a believer, if I'm what the Bible calls a saint, and I know that's a real struggle for some people, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to, I just recognize that's a struggle. Um, but that's what the Bible says we are. And for us to for us to get out of the Bible what the Lord wants us to, we have to honor the word. We have to honor what's spoken to us through the word to get the benefit out of it God has for us, right? So if I don't actually believe what God says about me in scripture, it's not that we're bad or things aren't going to go well. It just means I'm not going to get out of it what God put into it for me, okay? The scripture says that, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And about January, maybe it was even, I don't know. I feel like it was six months ago. I don't even know what I ate for dinner last night, so who knows? We'll just throw that out there because it sounds good. It was a while ago, and um, I heard this gentleman say, the reality is, because of the cross, there is no separation and no division between you and Jesus. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, to be honest with you, because I realized in that moment, I had been living as though there were. You know what I mean by that? Oh, God, help me with such and stuff. If you would just come and do such and such, if you would just do one more thing, I need one more good song. Oh, if they would play this great worship song at church, I know revival would come in my life, right? If Pastor Tom would actually preach something coherent, I know Jesus would touch my life. We look for one more thing. The problem is that's the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was one more sacrifice. It was one more goat, one more lamb, one more turtle dove, one more whatever it is to get the peace of God in my life. One more encounter, one more meeting, one more, one more, one more prayer. The encouragement to us today is out of Isaiah 60. It says, arise, 
shine, for your light has come. But God, I need one more. No, no, no. Arise, shine, for your light has come. But God, I just need you to do such and such before I serve. No, arise. But I don't understand. It's okay. Arise, trust me, and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord will, sh will shine all around you. But God, I'm in deep darkness. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put in you a light that's so bright, the Bible says nations will come to its rising. This morning, saints, as we leave this place, I want to encourage us just to take a moment and process with the Holy Spirit. God, have I believed the lie that you're not with me? Now, the truth of the matter is, if you've not surrendered your heart to Jesus, now would be a good time. Because that promise isn't for you unless you're, you choose to surrender your heart to Jesus. Invite him in. Say, God, I've, I've lived away from you. I've lived on my own. I've lived for myself long enough. I've lived in sin and brokenness long enough. And I need you. I need what you have. And I surrender my life to you. And you, 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 you become the Lord of my life. What that means is I, you get to take a blank piece of paper. I'll sign the bottom and say, I'll do whatever you put on there for me to do later. I don't need to know right up front. I'll do what you tell me to do. I'll obey. But those of us who have already done that, we need to walk myself. I'm saying we because it's me too. And we need to live in the reality of the finished work of the cross, that he has made you more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that this is the day the Lord has made for you. This is the day of salvation. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to sing a new song. I want to encourage us. I love this song because it actually gets me to think a little bit differently about my perspective. Am I believing my worldly perspective or am I seeing things how God sees them? So let's just take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to kind of work